Welcome to this week's Eccentric Minute, brought to you by Eccentric. This week's Eccentric Minute, we're going to review one of our foundational single leg exercises, and that is the K-Box Split Squat. Just like with the squat, guys, make sure you got that tether taunt when you're at full extension, and set yourself a counterbalance. Here we're going to use the barbell on the rack. Sink it down just like a regular split squat, chest tall, and drive through that front foot. I really like that back plate there to take tension off that back toe. As we progress forward, that's going to be big time to help us even keep our weight forward more. As we increase intensity and decrease volume, we're also typically cutting depth, therefore increasing transfer when we're looking at stopping power at a greater height. Guys, give this one a shot. I'm sure that this is one that you're going to find some great carryover for your athletes. I really hope you enjoyed this week's Eccentric Minute. Make sure you check them out at eccentric.com to find out everything you need about the K-Box and the K-Pulley. Being a strength and conditioning professional requires constant pursuit of better knowledge, better methods, and better means. But what if there was a place where strength and conditioning coaches could learn from some of the most innovative practitioners in the world, such as Jeff Moyer, Lachlan Wilmot, William Wayland, James the Thinker Smith, and Kirwenham Flat? you can find multiple lectures from each of these top level coaches and a few lectures and examples from yours truly as well all in the strength coach network the strength coach network is going to bring you well over a hundred different lectures from some of the top practitioners in the world to be your one-stop shop for your continuing education and professional development so hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com cbass today and get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar that's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASPS to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. I look forward to seeing you in the Strength Coach Network. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, I have the absolute pleasure of sitting down and discussing remote coaching with national-level athletes and how strong may be strong enough with the Canadian Olympic Committee's Scott Wilgris. Now, after a really quick intro, guys, Scott is going to dive right into the entire progression of how they built this program that he's utilizing with the national softball team. And this includes the steps of how it's gone from using Dropbox and Excel to different athlete management softwares and cloud-based technologies that they're using today. He then shares with us you know, how he's continuing to work with his different teams and how the monitoring and the programming has moved forward looking at it from both on-site to all over the world to make sure these athletes are continuing to progress when they're on the road. You know, in the next, we're going to dive right into talking about the work he's doing and trying to evaluate these athletes and figure out how strong is strong enough. And this includes the lift that he's looking at, why he's looking at that lift, and really where this magic number is that he's seeing and, and what is altering the training based on it. You know, and then, you know, looking more into those numbers, we start talking about bucketing and getting the players into really like a strong enough and not strong enough group. And then how the training has been manipulated around that and where he's seeing positive adaptations with the measurables he's looking at. This is really an awesome talk, guys. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Scott, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. AJ, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. For the people that may not know where you are and what you're getting into, Scott, let, let's talk about what you got cooking up there in Halifax. How'd you get up there? Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm currently the lead strength and conditioning coach at the Canadian Sports Center Atlantic. Um, I've been here for nine years. Uh, I actually started out my career uh, as a strength coach in Calgary, Alberta, closer to the Rockies. Um, where I, I interned with a guy named Matt Jordan, who some of your listeners might have uh, have heard. Uh, I was with Matt down there in, in Calgary for, uh, for three years. Um, and I, I did my master's degree uh, in, in kinesiology, uh, more of an exercise physiology-based master's uh, at the University of Calgary. Um, and I finished that up in 2010. And uh, my wife and I kind of decided it was time to, to check out the rest of the country, I guess. And we came over to Halifax in, um, in 2011, early 2011. And when I... First started here in Halifax, I was working with all provincial-based teams, um, you know, from uh, from sprint kayak to snowboarding to, uh, to soccer, so a big, uh, diverse level of provincial teams. And, um, you know, over the last nine years, that's kind of uh, developed into 
working primarily with national teams who are mostly decentralized in nature. Um, and so right now I'm working with uh, the women's artistic gymnastics team, who's actually in Germany uh, as we speak, about to start their Olympic qualification uh, world championships. I work with uh, sprint uh, women's kayak, so flat water sprint kayak. And then uh, the, probably the biggest uh, part of my, my time right now is spent with uh, the national team for women's softball. Yes. And let's get right into something we were talking about off camera here before. Something that's pretty intriguing to me and something that I think is going to start to continue to evolve and, and increase in, in its depth with what we do with the development of these young men and women. And that is the work you're doing training people remotely and monitoring and, and assessing them through cloud-based systems. So let's talk about what you're doing with that, where some of these ideas are coming from, and, and kind of how this has gotten its wheels turning and building. Yeah, so with the, with the softball team, I, I started working with them in 2016, and that kind of came about because the national team head coach is from Halifax, um, and we, him and I had worked together um, a little bit uh, leading up to 2016, which was when the Olympics uh, reinstated baseball and softball for the 2020 Tokyo Games. So um, when, when I first started, it was basically about sending out programs and trying to keep a little bit of tabs on the athletes and seeing what they were doing. So to not go too far in right away, I started out with, you know, Google or um, Excel spreadsheets in some drop boxes, uh, individual drop boxes. They were filling out their weights. I was checking into like 22 to 25 <laughs> drop boxes every week to, to make sure people were progressing and doing all that kind of stuff. And then to get a, an idea of their subjective uh, responses to training, you know, your classic Cooper McKinnon type stuff. Um, I was using a Google Forms uh, sheet that I was also collecting and, and kind of taking all that information in and, and sending some updates to the coaching staff, you know, every, every month kind of thing. That was kind of the first year. Um, after that first year, you know, I traveled with the team the next summer. We went to a bunch of different tournaments in, uh, in you know, the Dominican Republic and in all over the United States and um, built some relationships with the athletes and, and really felt like I was at a point where I could take, a, take the monitoring up for the next off season to, the, to another level. So we actually invested in a Canadian company called uh, Push, which you guys have probably potentially heard of. They're a, 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 an accelerometer and cloud-based uh, tracking system for, for weight training activities so that the athletes would wear the, the push band on their wrists or their waist and we would monitor, you know, to start off with, I just had them do their major lifts. So whether it was a split squat or a squat or deadlift um, or landmine pressing, they might uh, wear it for that. And then we would do every, once a week, they would do a set of three um, counter movement jumps and I would monitor that stuff, how they were kind of responding to training. Um, and uh, that was where I went with the, with the push bands in the first year. Um, and also I moved away from the Google-based uh, stuff. We went with another Canadian company for our athlete monitoring system. Uh, that's called Kinduct. Um, and, you know, through Kinduct, we're able to, to get, you know, emails sent out every night for the athletes to fill out their, um, their subjective questionnaires on, you know, their training load, um, their subjective RPEs, and also their, their sleep data and all that sort of stuff. So that was kind of year, year two. And then, you know, starting in year three, which was this last off season leading into this summer, um, I stepped up the, the push stuff a little bit more. I went to the point where I was programming every, every lift, every warm up, every energy system uh, development workout uh, for them through the push cloud um, and their, their online system, which has been great for you know, the, the ability to track what the athletes are doing, but also to really see how they're responding to the training programs. Just this week were, was our, this past week was our first week back into our um, fall training. And was able to see, you know, not only how much weight everybody lifted for their kind of main lift, which uh, in this case was a trap bar deadlift, but also what the, the set velocity was and, you know, who maybe underestimated their strength a little and who maybe overestimated their strength and give that feedback right away, even though the athletes are all over the continent basically right now. That's fascinating to me. And I love the fact now that there's wearables and things that you can do with that. So then let's now get into kind of the nitty gritty with it. Now you're talking about using the subjective end and you're talking about the objective end. So where are you seeing these kind of meshing together with these athletes that you get to work with? And then where with some of these other teams now that are in competition, because obviously at least not at the present moment, we're not able to be in Halifax, Nova Scotia and Germany at the same time. Not yet. How are you able then now to juggle the, the hands-on 
and the visual with the six hours away. <laughs> yeah, so I think with uh, with team, with the athletes that are that are spread out, um, what I've started to do is uh, just cut, break it down to the really really simple stuff that I can that I can collect. So you know, I uh, I've turned the um, subjective questionnaire into a recovery score, basically a percentage based on how what the optimal score would be, the top score would be, and the uh, their training load, uh, which is obviously is kind of a um, subjective RPE type. Of a, of a calculation, so minutes trained times um, intensity, uh, subjective intensity, to create a training load score, and I, I kind of have those two things on a on a chart. So if you can visualize a quadrant style chart with um, training load going up and down, and uh, subjective response or their recovery score left and right, um, and actually using a Z score to to look at their individual trend, whether they're trending up or down, and I kind of can visualize that as as the, the entire team or the entire group on one. Uh, chart that I'll then send to the to the coaching staff or the people that are there. So right now the the, the team's uh, two physios for the gymnastics uh, group are in in competition. They're about to start, you know. So in the last week when they're in training camp, I can send them some information on you know who's whose training loads are really really high compared to their norm, um, whose are maybe a little bit lower, um, and who's feeling really good or who's feeling really recovered compared to where they those people have been um, over the last over the last month or so. I love that, dude. Now, how are the coaches when it comes to the communication process as well? And, and I ask that like that because it's a two-sided question. Being involved with someone who's not involved in the hands-on at times can be challenging. So how are these sport coaches kind of being involved and assisting and is evaluating the word I want, the process? And how then are they receiving this? Yeah, I think that's a very, very good question. And, you know, I think when I started out, the coaches really wanted the training load data to almost keep tabs on whether the athletes were training or not training. Like that's how, that's what kind of drew them in. Um, it wasn't necessarily to be used for, for changing training down the road. It was just to make sure they were actually training. And um, I think since we've been, um, we've gone on I, and I've developed these kind of quick visualizations for them. Um, and it started out, I was just kind of sending it out and giving quick comments. You know, that first six months, not a lot of feedback probably from the coaches. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the first year of, of doing this, I, I asked them, you know, is this valuable? Do you guys find this useful? And they, to, to, a, to, a, to a coach, they said, yes, like 100%, I love these. And, and they use it to, you know, if, if for the softball example, you know, if a player is trending really high on their training load in season, you know, if that's a bat that they don't want out of the lineup, they might DH them that day. And if it's, you know, a, a person that maybe deserves a day off anyway, but they were wavering, then they're, they're going to give them that day off. And so it's, it's gone over really well. It did take time. It wasn't, you know, the first weekend that I, that I started collecting data. They weren't using it, obviously. Uh, it takes time to develop the individual norms and all that sort of stuff. But um, I think we've gotten to a good place with it. I love that because I think that then now empowering the coach also to have that ability to have that plug and play on top of it is really something in selfishly is something that I didn't do right. And I messed up on when I first built my program and it was something that um, looking back, I'd probably punch myself in the face over if I'm going to be totally frank. Yeah. And even for me, I mean, it wasn't uh, this again, this is a, uh... I'm nine years into my my role here in, in Halifax and three years in with softball. But before I was I started working with softball, I worked with um, uh, the sailing, uh, boxing, and, and and hockey national teams uh, at various levels. And I might have jumped in too quick with a couple of those and maybe turned some coaches off. So I learned my lesson uh, a long time ago with that sort of stuff. Um, and you know, just to kind of slow cook that process and make sure that you uh, build the buy-in and don't overwhelm the coaches or the athletes that you're asking. Um, them for all this information from no doubt man and then on top of what you're doing with that right you brought up the idea of making sure just initially that these men and women were progressing at some point right just adding more load or more bar speed or more reps or whatever it may be but you've also started running down that rabbit hole of one of those magic questions that people like to ask when it comes to what we do and that is uh what are they strong enough <laughs> yeah yeah, so I mean, in the uh, in the softball example, 
um, you know, the first season, it became really obvious to me that there was a lot of room and a lot of, uh, a lot of room to gain by just getting these athletes stronger. You know, they'd all come through NCAA programs and lots of them did fairly solid strength uh, programs. And one of the things that they may or may not have done uh, were, you know, were they held accountable all the time? Did they keep it up during the in-season? Um, and did they keep it up during their, their, their Team Canada season uh, when they were with the national team? And, you know, it, it started to look like no is probably the answer. So we really pushed for, for max strength that first year. And from, you know, our physical testing battery that we would do in the fall and then again in the spring, uh, you know, obviously speed was one of the big things that we tested along with uh, trap bar uh, 1RM strength. Um, and, you know, the first year, everybody got stronger, everybody got faster. Uh, the second off season, though, I started to notice some trends uh, when I was kind of going over the, the data. You know, players that got stronger um, didn't necessarily get faster anymore, and that's one of the things that I'd always been sort of thinking about. Um, so I kind of went into their monitoring data, and so like I mentioned earlier, one of the monitoring pieces that I did was I took um, or taking daily uh, counter movement jump scores. So basically, the, the athletes do three counter movement jumps. Take the average of that and just kind of look at that over the over the season and i started to notice some some very similar trends with the athletes who were already strong to start the uh the winter training uh phase and um and how much their speed like their sprinting speed increased or didn't increase and what their kind of movement jump trend was like throughout the year and it definitely turned uh out that the people who had you know max strength levels of about 1.7 to 1.9 times body weight in the trap bar deadlift, which is a low bar trap bar deadlift or above, um, didn't necessarily get faster or respond super well to, um, to the pure strength type training it, with the uh, push jump monitoring uh, versus the players who did, who were a little bit weaker to begin with. Those guys, you know, they responded really well. Their, their, their jump monitoring went up, their speed uh, went up. And so that really got me to think, you know, what, how, can I, how can I figure out what this number is? So using some um, you know, um, statistic, statistical analysis, looking at some effect sizes, I split them up into groups, either um, below to start the season off, uh, below 1.7 times body weight or above 1.7 times body weight, um, and looked at their change in, not only their change in strength over the off season, but also their change in speed over the off season. And there was, a, there was a huge relationship between the athletes who were weaker to begin with and how much they improved in, in strength, or sorry, in speed, and the athletes that were already strong and how much they improved. So coming into this last off season, I used that information to at least initially bucket, bucket athletes into you know, stronger versus weaker and you know, really decrease the emphasis on, on maximal strength with those already strong players that were over you know, 1.7 times body weight. Um, and went to much more of a velocity-based training uh, style of, a, of approach, which I was lucky enough to be able to do uh, remotely using the push bands, um, just with a little bit of um, uh, education on the athletes um, to, you know, get them to set up their velocity cutoffs, get them to um, really, you know, emphasize every rep, uh, giving full intent, but, and also getting to trust me that lifting sub-maximally was going to be okay. Devil's advocate question. Yeah. How much sprinting were you doing with them if we're looking at speed metrics? They would have done. So the way that I usually set up my programming is I'll have uh, a linear speed for each phase uh, emphasis and a lateral speed for each, um, each, each phase. And that kind of progresses from, you know, in the, in the early off season, uh, they're going to do, you know, for linear speed, it's some wall drills and some, some prowler marching and that sort of stuff. Um, and then obviously later in the season, it's, it's much more top speed based stuff. Um, and we kind of progress through there. Um, and those, those are uh, two to three times a week, uh, we would do some speed. So, you know, a, a, a speed day in the middle of the off season might be six times 20 meters um, from, a, from a dead start or from a, from a varied start type position. Late, a little bit later in the off season, it might be, you know, four or five times um, 30 meters with kind of a build up, and the, the goal is to hit top speed later. So. They were sprinting a lot, um, and I just think that one of the things I started to think about was, you know, how much energy was I was I draining from them by getting them to, you know, grind out these heavy reps day after day um, when you know they were already strong enough, and I might have been taken away from that speed work that they were doing at the same time. So now let's run down this rabbit hole of these buckets. 
what are these differences? What do they entail? And now what are the benefits of it? Because I think that this is something, right, that a lot of people talk about, that a lot of people do, and then a lot of people look at it, and really it's just a matter, for some people, it's just like, well, instead of doing three sets of ten, I'm doing three sets of five. <laughs> yeah, so you know what? I actually, in, in that same first offseason where I noticed, uh, where everybody did essentially the same program, and I noticed the differences in, um, in speed adaptation, everybody did a, a French contrast phase um, in the sort of late offseason. And then they followed that up with a power type phase or a speed based phase. Um, I found that the, the, the athletes who were already strong um, from the jump metrics, it was a bit of a lag and it lagged beyond when we did our speed testing, but the jump metrics really responded well to that French contrast phase in the very strong athletes, like 1.9 times body weight or, or higher in the trap bar deadlift. And it crushed the people that were under 1.7 times. Like they, they, some of them didn't recover for months from the hole that that French contrast phase put them into. And that would have been like three days a week of, of, um, you know, the, the three to four sets of a French contrast circuit and then some accessory lifts. Um, so that's one of the things that I started to look at. I started to look at who was responding in terms of the jump metrics um, really well to this, to that type of training. And then last year, um, I had the, the stronger athletes start that stuff earlier um, in the year and went through two cycles of the French contrast phase uh, with, paired with a, uh, with a more speed-based phase. And, you know, I just kind of saw those jump metrics continue to climb. Um, and, I, and that continued into the in-season a little bit, actually. Uh, and then for the, the, strong, the weaker athletes, you know, I went with kind of a really simple, you know, Jim Wendler 5-3-1 style of, like, just get stronger, don't get hurt, um, but just keep to push the, pushing the weights a little bit. Um, and that was that we kind of cycled that uh, with, with the contrast phase, um, again, over, over and over in the off-season just a regular contrast phase. And, you know, that's, I've, I've started to get a little bit more simple, I think, with my periodization once I get to know the athletes, you know, and, and they've, they've, their training years um, advance, I guess, in the sense that I try to figure out what works and what maybe doesn't work, and then I just do what works over and over again <laughs> until it doesn't work anymore. Imagine that. If, if you just keep doing what works, it keeps working, and then when it stops working, you change it. Exactly. And that's what the benefit of all this monitoring that I'm, that I'm doing is, like, I would have had no idea what was happening in between um, October and April for those two off seasons if I hadn't, didn't have something in place to monitor. And, you know, the subjective stuff comes into that as well. Um, you know, if people are, are, are crashing a little bit but feeling really, really good, you know, maybe that's when I push them an extra week. Or if people are, you know, jump metrics are crashing, subjective stuff's crashing, you know, it's time to, time to cut the cord on that, uh, that phase and get, give some people maybe earlier rest than, than others. And that's, that's what I did last winter. Um, for, you know, four or five different athletes in each bucket of the program. So then how do you demonstrate that to the group as to why that's when you're pulling? Because, like, I love that, and I, I'm a firm believer in what you're saying because I think that, A, it makes sense, and, B, it's right, right? Like, you wouldn't take your car in to get new tires if the tires are still fine. Like, why are we changing the tires? But when you have different people they're all adapting at a different rate and they all have a different level of preparedness and readiness at those times so now you have you know softball player a who's totally reached their adaptive limit while b is still chugging along and probably has another week or two left in this program until they need to make changes so how do you sell that to both of them because like this one is like, well, why is they, why are they doing something new? That's cool. And this one is like, could be like, well, why am I getting changes? Is there something wrong with me? I was, I was really lucky uh, in the sense that when I presented some of the findings from that initial off season uh, to the coaches, um, they let me present to the players. So I presented to the players with everybody's off season uh, jump monitoring. And I split them up into the groups that did and didn't respond to these these types of phases, and showed them their 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 like daily rolling three day average of uh, of jump velocities, and saw you know who who was doing really well, who wasn't doing well, and then I kind of gave them an idea of what I was at the time thinking for this this the next off season, which was the one that just passed. Um, and you know on a weekly, uh, now it's more like a bi weekly basis. I'll send out a group sort of trend analysis of their jumps, just again, Z scores. So I use the previous three days of jumping versus the previous 14 days of jumping as their 
current trend, how they're trending. And I'll send that out to the whole group, who's trending up, who's trending down. And so they, they kind of get used to that. They know that it's a thing that's, that's happening in the background. They know that I know, you know who's doing well and who's not doing well. And so it makes the conversations really, really easy um, to have. So then how do they take looking at those numbers? Now, I know that, like, you said that they're ready for it, but still, people are competitive. People also sometimes take things personally. And when you're showing, when you're showing me that Scott's kicking my ass and yeah. my numbers are going down and your numbers are going up, how do you see that taken by the athletes? So that, I think that was a, um, definitely a trust piece and a trust in the program with the softball group. With some of the other sports I work with, I still don't think, and I've worked with kayaking for longer than I have with, uh, with softball, but I don't think I'd be at the point where I'd be able to do that with the kayakers. A, it's, it's an individual team sport, right? They're a team, but they're actually competing against each other. And that does exist in softball for sure. But I think that with including our mental performance coach and our coaching staff, you know, there's this culture of, you know, what did we do today to make sure we get better? They've put a lot of their egos aside and, and have really focused on, you know, let's just make sure that we're doing everything we can do every day to get better. So I think, to I guess to answer your question, I was really lucky uh, to step into to this. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't a couple athletes that maybe have, you know, more questions or are a little bit more skeptical about this type of stuff. Um, and then for those, it's just, you know, continuing to, to talk about it. Now, one thing I do is I, I don't necessarily show them any of the actual outcomes. Like, so say, you know, player A is, is jumping with a, with a velocity of 3.0 meters per second, or peak velocity of 3.0 meters per second, and player B is, you know, 2.6. Um, I don't show them those numbers necessarily. It's just the Z score. So, you know, that number just kind of becomes, you know, who's trending in which direction? Am I doing well? Am I doing okay right now? Or am I in a, in a hole? And I think that makes it a little bit easier too, where, you know, they know that people respond differently now after a couple of years of, you know, presentations and conversations with me, talking to them about how this kind of is going to go. And I think that's been helpful. I love that, man. So then also too with these, and I don't know if you can share this or not, and if you can't, we'll edit this out, but what were some hiccups that you had with that? Because I think that like, the one thing, like Scott, like what's really easy, right, is we're talking about this now and you're like, man, yeah, everything's great. You know, like these women kick butt and they're all dialed in and they get this. But like we both know it's not always like that. So where were some spots where you had to take a step back to kind of reevaluate how you were putting this together? Because I think people think at times this might be a little easier than it is. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, you know, for me to stand up there and show them uh, that I had put, you know, some of them in a, in a pretty big well, – myself and them obviously doing the, doing the workouts, but that what I was programming for them, put them in a hole that lasted halfway through their season. Um, that was tough. And I don't think everybody was super excited to see that, you know, like when they saw they, they started their season in May and they didn't get out of the kind of physical hole that they were in to start the year until uh, the middle of July. And then the season was over in early August. Like that was kind of a, you know, a few of them had some concerns about that, which is totally understandable. Um, but I think that, I just try to explain to them that, you know, I'm using this as a learning process. I'm trying to figure out what works well for you and what doesn't work well for you. And, you know, that, that's, that's kind of where, where I took, the, took it to the next level, I guess. And, again, luckily, I was able to have that trust in place beforehand that uh, that, that went over okay. I think for some, some athletes, you know, again, I was lucky. No, no one, nobody's spot on the roster was, uh, was put in, in jeopardy by any of this stuff. Uh, so that's that's lucky, but again, that's where I think you know trying to learn as quickly as you can what uh, what you're doing, how it works, and how it doesn't work is, is key with a lot of these athletes. And that's where the monitoring, having a really simple and really consistent monitoring piece comes in. Yeah, and just making sure that that monitoring piece is being shown that it's impacting what you're doing, it just might yeah. be as important. Yeah, for sure. Well, listen, Scott, let me get you out of here on this, brother. Where can people Learn more, see more, find more of what you're doing. Yeah, so I mean, I have uh, I have Instagram. Uh, Instagram is S Dub Strength. Um, you know, I have uh, I have Twitter, which I use a little bit less. It's um, Swift Wilgris, um, and those are basically the two main main pieces. I, I've recently written a bit of an article for the Canadian Strength and Conditioning Association, um, which you could probably Google and find me, and that's going to be um, kind of actually it takes you. 
through a, the process that I just tried to articulate here on the uh, on the call and uh, with the softball, basically. And yeah, so those would be the two main places you'd be able to find me. Love it, brother. We'll make sure that those two ats are in the in the notes. Scott, truly appreciate your time, buddy. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jay. It was uh, it was awesome. Yeah, man. We'll be in touch real soon, brother. Thank you so much. Cheers. No worries. Thank you. And a huge thanks to Canadian Olympic Committee Scott Wilgris for sitting down and talking with us today. Guys, just some open, honest, candid sharing and some stuff to really make you think. You know, he's sitting there and he, he's got these numbers. He's got these things he's looking at. He's got what he's seeing. And it's awesome that he's been able to take this data, look at it, and start to manipulate the training to make sure he's doing best by his athletes. Scott, I can't thank you enough for what you're doing and what you're sharing, man. This is absolutely sensational stuff. And guys, make sure you give them a follow on the gram at Strength. That's S-D-U-B-S-T-R-E-N-G-T-H. Uh, putting out great content as well. And as always, guys, if you did enjoy the talk, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. As always, we are just trying to get the best information out there to all the great coaches that we can. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.